Computer Science and Eng Engineering. Um, today, it's my great honor to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Minan Tambi from USC. Um, Mene is a world leading AI researcher with huge impact in both academia and also the rest of the world, the society. Um, he's a professor at USC and also the founding co director of uh, USC um, Center for AI in, AI AI for, uh, in Society. Um, he's a fellow of Triple AI and also ACM. He won many awards, um, like Last year, each time John McCarthy Award, this year, uh, Triple AI um, Eggman Memory Lecture Award, and uh, many other awards like ACM uh, Agent Research Award, and there are many, many others. I won't um, mention those. He has made fundamental uh, contribution to both theory, multi agent systems, and also uh, work on not um, doing projects which has a huge impact in the world. I guess the, the beauty from his research is the marriage of theory to, to the uh, practice, to the real world applications. I think today he's going to tell us about um, what he has been done over the last maybe five years um, uh, about applying AI for uh, you know, social good. Uh, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Menon Tambi for his uh, distinguished lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Bo, for a very, very kind introduction. Uh, Bo uh, was a postdoc with me at USC, and he's a superstar, so I'm really glad that he's here. And thank you all for coming. Um, it's really always a great pleasure to come to NTU, and always really fantastic to talk to all of our colleagues here. So with uh, you know, advances in AI and multi-agent systems, it is now important to direct these advances towards societal benefits. And I'll focus on three areas, public safety and security, conservation, and public health. In all of these areas, viewing these societal problems as multi-agent systems, we can see a key research challenge that cuts across these areas. How to optimize our limited intervention resources when uh, interacting with other agents in these domains? Is there? Just want to turn off the lights. Oh, OK, OK. So I'm going to focus on two main solution approaches. One, computational game theory as an approach that cuts across these problem areas in addressing these problems. And the idea of end-to-end, data-to-deployment, being crucial in doing this research. With respect to public safety and security, we have a large number of targets to protect limited security resources. How to schedule or plan or allocate our resources taking into account a watchful adversary. We've contributed a new model called Stackelberg Security Games and contributed new algorithms that have been in use by security agencies in the United States and internationally. With respect to conservation, we have large conservation areas to protect limited number of rangers. Here we have contributed a new model called Green Security Games. For the past several years working with Uganda Wildlife Authority, harnessing past poaching data, we are able to predict where poachers may set traps or snares. And for last several years, been able to remove a large number of such snares and even get poachers arrested. The model is being extended towards combating illegal fishing and illegal logging. With respect to public health, the challenge is that we have limited number of social worker resources. Here I'll focus on concretely the work we've been doing in homeless shelters in Los Angeles, harnessing the social network of homeless youth we show that our influence maximization algorithms are far more effective in spreading information about HIV amongst homeless youth compared to traditional approaches. And these algorithms are based on these ideas of games against nature. And we show that similar ideas are useful for combating TB, for nutritional challenges in low resource communities and others. In all of this work, interdisciplinary partnerships with the government and non-governmental organizations have been crucial. To that end, we have really patrolled with the US Coast Guard on their boats in New York. We have really patrolled with wildlife conservation agencies in forests in Malaysia. Our students have spent time in homeless shelters in Los Angeles. All of this immersion is important to understand what kind of data to actually collect. Based on that, a predictive model, machine learning, can help us predict 
which are higher versus low risk cases, for example. Following that, a prescriptive algorithm, again, theoretic intervention algorithm, may recommend which high and low risk, low risk cases to actually intervene on, given that we have limited resources. But what's equally important for us is field testing and deploying these algorithms. This is not only because we care deeply about the societal impact, but because this is a way to validate our models, to understand weaknesses in our assumptions, and that's where many of our research problems actually originate. So in the rest of this presentation, I'll focus on the three areas I mentioned. I'll start with public safety and security. Since this is an earlier part of our work, I'll focus less time on that, but focus more on the more recent work on conservation and public health. All of the work has been published in conferences such as AMAS, AAA, and Nichkai, where you will find simulation results. In this talk, though, my focus will be more on real-world evaluation. If you're interested, there are these books that you can buy uh, that outline our work. If you buy these books, then from the royalties, I can take my students out to a nice dinner. So I hope you'll buy them. But I will also want to recognize my PhD students and postdocs by putting up their pictures in the top right-hand corners for the work where they on the slides where the work is represented. So let's get going, start talking about public safety and security. This is clearly a global challenge. Events of 9-11 were clearly devastating for all of us. I've grown up in the city of Mumbai in India, and that has faced a number of terrorist attacks. So this problem has been something that's been on top of my mind. For example, 11 July 2006, bombs went off in this train in Mumbai. Fortunately, luckily, my mother got off the train before the bombs went off. But these sorts of events have raised the issue of public safety and security in my mind. And so when chief of airport police at LAX airport approached us, Errol Southers, to improve security at the airport, his concern was somebody driving a suicide truck into one of the terminals has happened in Glasgow in 2007. The challenge is there's eight inbound roads into the airport eight terminals, but not enough officers to be on all roads or not enough dogs to be at all terminals. Where and when should you schedule checkpoints and canine patrols? The question for us is could we propose game theory as a means of optimizing the use of limited resources? Could we convince scientific advisory committees that game theory was the right approach? Could we convince our AI reviewers that game theory could be used in this practical fashion? And could we convince sergeants on the ground that this was the right approach? That's what we decided to do. We proposed a new model called Stackelberg Security Games. I'm going to illustrate this using a simple two by two example. So here we have an airport with just two terminals and one defender unit, a simple toy example. So if the defender always tries to protect terminal one, an adversary conducting surveillance will attack terminal two, the adversary gets a positive reward of one, the police get a negative reward minus one. If as a result, the police were to switch and always protect terminal two, the adversary will attack terminal one, the adversary again gets a positive reward. So any deterministic strategy, the adversary would defeat. If the police were to use a mixed strategy, a randomized strategy, 60% of the time they're at terminal one, 40% of the time they're at terminal two, an adversary conducting surveillance will only know that the police are there 60%, here 40%, what they'll do tomorrow remains unpredictable. These kinds of games are called Stackelberg games because defender commits first to a randomized strategy and then the adversary responds. It's a security game because it's played on targets. Payouts are based on whether targets are covered or not. And we're optimizing the use of our limited resources. We're not guaranteeing 100% security because in the real world there is no such thing. So this is how the armor system was built at LAX. We start with the game matrix and we'll come to where we got the payoffs. This is fed into a mixed integer program that generates a mixed defender strategy. Probability that there's a canine patrol at 8 a.m. at terminals 2, 5, and 6 is 0.17. Probability at 8 a.m. there's canine patrols at terminals 3, 5, and 7 is 0.33, and so on. And then we sample from this distribution to generate an actual schedule. For example, at 8 a.m., send team 1 to terminal 2, team 3 to terminal 5, team 5 to terminal 6. At 9 a.m., do something different. And this is an actual schedule that the police officers can then execute. So let's very briefly look at how the mixed integer program is written. We are trying to maximize defender expected utility. 
RIJ refers to the reward to the defender if the defender takes a strategy I and the adversary takes a strategy J. XI is the probability with which the defender takes a strategy I. For example, X1 is the probability there's a dog on terminal one and a dog on terminal two. X2 is the probability there's a dog on terminal two and a dog on terminal three. For every single combination of defender resources to targets, there's a probability variable. QJ is the adversary's best response. We model the fact that the adversary conducts surveillance of the defender's mixed strategy and then chooses one terminal to attack one best response. Now let's look at where the payoffs come from. At LAX, the threat was somebody driving a suicide truck into one of the terminals. The loss to the defender, if such an event were to occur, would be the loss of human lives. We had from the airport detailed numbers on how many people were present at different times of the day at, at different terminals. On the basis of that, we could generate a payoff matrix. In all of the examples I will show, that we have detailed numbers on potential lives lost and economic consequences. Of course, these estimates are not perfect, so we need to be able to handle uncertainty. I'm not gonna have time to go into that. We've spent enormous amounts of time focusing on this. But with all of this framework in place, Armour was operational at the airport. It's the first such application of computational game theory for operational security. And soon there was news in Los Angeles uh, TV channels about the system being operational and weapons being captured at checkpoints. For example, in January of 2009, all of these guns captured at the checkpoints. This, of course, made the LAX police happy, and in fact, someone at the city hall was clearly very happy because we got commendations, myself and my students, from the city of Los Angeles. Up to that point, we had been very honored to have received Best Paper Awards, but this was clearly a different and great honor. Errol Southers even went to United States Congress to talk about our work. LAX is safer today than it was 18 months ago. A team of research led by Dr. Malen Tombe we work with our department to develop Armor. This software randomizes our vehicle checkpoints along airport access roads and the deployment of our explosives detection canine teams throughout the airport. And there was news media coverage like Newsweek saying Armor throws a digital cloak of invisibility, which of course led my colleagues at the AMOS conference next year to ask if we were working on a cloaking device. But this got the attention of the Federal Air Marshals. And this is from our visit to the Federal Air Marshals Freedom Center, home of their home. Right at the entrance is a memorial to 9-11 victims. There's rubble from the Pentagon, rubble from the World Trade Center, pieces of the planes that crashed into the World Trade Center, clearly motivating us that whatever they ask us to do, we will definitely complete. The challenge was how to assign air marshals to flights. This is a massive problem. Let's look at why this problem is so difficult to solve. This is the game in a normal form. Along the rows are all possible ways air marshals could be assigned to flights. Air marshals could be assigned to flights one, two, three, one, two, four, one, three, five, and so forth. Along the columns are all the possible ways the adversaries could attack. They could attack flight one, flight two, up to flight 1,000. There's 10 to the power 41 rows because there's 10 to the power 41 different combinations of assigning air marshals to flights, which means there's 10 to the power 41 XI variables in our mixed integer program, which means this program cannot run. It cannot run, but if we could make it run, what we would find is that most of these XI variables are zero. The support set size is small. In fact, we can prove that for a security game with T targets, Optimal solutions of support set size T plus one always exist. So if somebody could magically tell us which XI variables are zero, and we could remove those rows from the game matrix, we are left with much, much smaller game matrix, which if we solve, we get the exact same solution as the larger game matrix. So it's based on this insight that we developed a new exact algorithm for scale up. It's idea of incremental strategy generation and the first such algorithm for Stackelberg security games. We start with a master problem, which has just a small number of pure strategies. And there's a slave problem, which using LP duality theory tells us what's the next best pure strategy to add. And we iterate in this fashion until we converge to a global optimal. But now we have only a thousand Defender pure strategies, only a thousand rows instead of 10 to the power 41. This is how we built IRIS for assigning air marshals to flights. If you've been on a US air carrier, United, American, Delta, and so forth, 
whether there was an air marshal or not on your flight, if flying internationally, may have been determined by this program. We were very honored that our work was again mentioned in the United States Congress in a committee hearing and the certificate of appreciation from the federal air marshals. This work got us introduced to the US Coast Guard. And for them, we built this system called PROTECT to generate patrols in different ports like Boston and Los Angeles and New York. PROTECT, like ARMOR, is an acronym. This is to tell you that we spend enormous amounts of time coming up with good acronyms for our projects. <laughs> One novelty in PROTECT was generating patrols around the Staten Island Ferry, which is a moving target. These algorithms, which are implemented, completely changed the way the Coast Guard generated these patrols. I'm going to illustrate the challenge here using the special temporal graphs. This is discrete space and time graph. It can be extended to continuous time. So here we have three locations, A, B, and C, three time points, five, 10, and 15 minutes. All dashed lines show the way in which boats can travel in this graph. For example, this ferry shown by green line starts from C, goes to B, then goes to A. The patrol boat shown by the red line starts from B, then goes to C, then goes back to B. In fact, the patrol boat can follow any of these different red lines in this graph. And so there's exponential number of n to the power t routes. We show that this expo despite this exponential number of routes, we can solve this problem in a in efficiently by using this idea of marginals, which allows scale up without solution quality loss. So given the fact that we were able to solve all these problems for the Coast Guard, we were very honored to receive meritorious team commendations from the United States Coast Guard in their Atlantic area headquarters. And again, very honored that our work was mentioned in a congressional testimony in the United States Congress. We're working with the University of Southern California to uh, utilize game theory as a way of optimizing and scheduling our patrol makes it harder for somebody to anticipate where the patrols will be. So in all of this work, you will notice this data to deployment pipeline, full pipeline beginning to end. And this field testing is important, as I said, not only because we care deeply about having societal impact, but because often it outlines for us key limitations in our models and assumptions. For example, we, implement, we generated patrols on trains in Los Angeles to look for fair evaders, people traveling without tickets. Initial patrols said, well, just follow these trains, you know, go from station to station, etc." Then we realized these patrols failed completely. This is because officers would often stop. They would arrest people if people hadn't bought tickets and so forth. And so patrols would often get interrupted. Somehow we needed to handle these interruptions in our patrols. But this problem, we would have never imagined sitting in our labs. It's only after deployment that some of these problems have become apparent. So today we are absolutely thrilled to see security games work being picked up in many different research labs around the world, many different applications, including here in Singapore. And there's work in Africa, which I'll come to next, on wildlife conservation. But before we go there, I just want to briefly touch on evaluation to show that claim that security games are superior in optimizing the use of limited resources compared to traditional approaches. So here I'm showing you evaluation done by the US Coast Guard in the port of Boston. What I'm showing you there are patrols done before PROTECT was deployed. Along the X axis are different days of the week. Along the Y axis, how frequently a particular target was visited. The green line on the top is how frequently a target was visited on day one, on day two, and day three, and so on. Different lines are different targets. There's very few patrols on day two. This was a good day to attack the port of Boston. All these lines crisscross, meaning some day a target is more important, next day it becomes less important, third day it becomes more important, but targets don't change their value day to day. After PROTECT was deployed, you'll see the dip on day two disappears, the more important targets are visited more, the less important targets are visited less. On any given day where the patrol boat will go remains unpredictable. But on the whole, the more important targets are visited more. If you look at it from the perspective of defender expected utility, there is a 350% improvement in defender expected utility. The air marshals did a head-to-head -head comparisons, humans versus game theory. After six months, they concluded that the game theoretic scheduler was better. And in fact, there's a US government accountability office report talking about weaknesses of human schedulers. We did a head-to-head -head comparison, humans versus 
game theoretic schedulers to schedule 90 police officers on trains in Los Angeles for a counterterrorism exercise. And then we had external evaluators evaluating these patrols based on 12 questions. Their conclusion was that the game theoretic patrols were superior. So human beings took two days sitting in a room, uh, a team of people trying to come up with these schedules, and in the end, their patrols were worse. We also sent patrollers on trains in Los Angeles looking for people traveling without tickets, once using our game theoretic patrols, once using a baseline approach. For 21 days, they patrolled under identical conditions. Conclusion, game theoretic patrols were able to catch 60% more people traveling without tickets. At the checkpoints at Los Angeles airport, the numbers of arrests of people grew fivefold from before to after. The main point here is that there's significant evidence here that security games are effective in optimizing the use of limited resources. Today, we are extending the work towards screening passengers at airport checkpoints and towards cyber deception. So now let me turn to conservation, and this is work done jointly with Dr. Andy Plumtree in conservation biology. So before we begin, let's think about what it is that we are fighting for. This is Murchison Falls National Park in Uganda. These are my pictures of animals there, it's just magnificent wildlife. But there's threats to the wildlife, snares or traps. In fact, thousands of these snares used to maim and kill animals. To optimize the use of limited ranger resources, we've contributed this model called Green Security Game. So let's take the Queen Elizabeth National Park. We are going to divide this up into one kilometer by one kilometer grid square. Each grid square is a target. And now we can write our mixed integer program just like before to run. Unfortunately, this doesn't work. This is because what we are facing are adversaries that are not fully strategic, but multiple boundedly rational poachers. They're not gonna give this best response. Instead, we are going to learn the adversary's bounded rational response by looking at past poaching data. So at each grid location I, we have the probability that a snare will be set by an adversary based on the range of patrol frequency and other features at that grid cell. And then we can optimize range of patrol. So attention now shifts to learning this function GI. So we have 12 years of past poaching data from Uganda. For example, for each grid square, we have how, you know, distance to roads and rivers, slope of the area, range of patrol frequency, and we're trying to learn the probability with which a snare will be set. There is, however, one difficulty in this data set. When a ranger reports a snare has been found, yes, a snare has been found. But when the ranger reports the snare has not been found, then it could just be the case that they just needed a w to walk a little bit more and they could have found a snare. That means that the negative instances are not very reliable. To combat this imperfection in the data set, we created this ensemble model. So here, for example, this is one filtered data set. We create multiple such filtered data set. In this filtered data set, anywhere where the ranger has walked less than one kilometer and reported no snare has been found, we remove all those negative instances and then we learn a classifier. Here, the filter has been set at two kilometers. Wherever a ranger has walked less than two kilometers and said no snare has been found, we remove those instances because we don't trust those instances. Learn another classifier. And so we learn all these different classifiers and at the test time, given, the, you know, given these different classifiers, we run this as an ensemble. So if a test instance comes in, with a patrol effort less than two kilometers, two of the classifiers are active. More than two kilometers, let's say, more of the classifiers are active. So we certainly can test this in the lab, and we show that our model is more precise, more accurate in making predictions compared to other standard machine learning approaches. Unfortunately, this was clearly insufficient for our partners, Uganda Wildlife Authority and Wildlife Conservation Society. They wanted us to do tests in the field. So in 2016, we selected these two nine square kilometer areas in the Queen Elizabeth National Park that were infrequently patrolled and were not previous hotspots. And here's the areas we selected. We asked them to patrol these green dots. You see that they don't overlap with the red dots where previously snares have been found. So we're not asking them, go to where you found snares previously. And we asked them to patrol, do these patrols one month before a conference deadline, which means that if snares will be found, we are going to be able to write a paper. If there's no snares, there's not gonna be any paper. And we sent patrollers out, 
And so every day they would patrol and send back an email saying this is what happened today. Initially nothing, and then one day a poached elephant with its tusks cut off. So we were too late for this elephant, but at least the machine learning system was pointing us in the right direction. Then good news, a whole elephant snare roll was found and removed. So poachers were active in the area, they were killing elephants, but before they could kill the next set of elephants, we were able to remove a large number of snares, potentially saving lives of elephants. Then whole antelope snares were found. Our paper reports different hit rates and other kinds of measures to show that this machine learning was really being effective in making predictions compared to what they had been doing in the past. This started generating some confidence in this model, but there was one criticism. This is Uganda. If you go to any national park, go to any area which hasn't been patrolled before, you're going to find some snares. So to address this criticism, we ran a six-month trial in two national parks in Uganda. We selected 24 separate patrol areas in each of these national parks. Some our model predicted were high risk, more snares would be found. Some our model predicted were low risk, no snares would be, less number of snares would be found. The rangers didn't know which one was which. We sent them out six months, they patrolled, and the answer question was, does our model predict the right things? And indeed, in the Queen Elizabeth National Park, where we predicted high number of snares, more snares were found compared to low number of snares. And in Murchison Falls, high, medium, and low predictions were seen to work out. So this has generated a lot of confidence that these models are going in the right direction. But it is my belief that we have to continually stress test these models and check them out in the field. So our recent work has been in Cambodia. This is the Sripok National Park. Perhaps some of you have gone and visited this. This is the place where tigers will be reintroduced in Southeast Asia from where they have been completely wiped out. So we were just there last month. So these are my images of this uh, national park. Wonderful place in case you haven't visited. Go visit, it's just nearby to you. So here's some pictures with the ranger. So this uh, gentleman is a former Khmer Rouge soldier who is now a ranger. Uh, so we worked with the rangers there and we even saw our poachers being arrested. And so we had made predictions for them, low and high risk areas, and indeed they're able to find lots of snares. Where we predicted high risk, more snares have been found, less risky areas, less snares have been found. And in fact, the numbers of snares from 2018, 101 snares per month before we came in to today, 521 snares per month since our tests have started. So numbers of snare captures have jumped a lot. Tremendous excitement in our collaborators. For example, Rohit Singh, head of these Cambodia operations, saying, I'm super excited with the results. Let's get this going on other countries too this year. So this is exciting. And again, going back to our data to deployment pipeline, what I'm talking about here are predictions that are made from historical ground truth. Now I want to talk about work on integrating real-time information in this pipeline by drones. So we've been working with this NGO called Air Shepherd. They fly drones in South Africa and Botswana, and they take infrared videos. The infrared videos are beamed to a van where a person is sitting late at night watching the videos and trying to spot poachers. And you can see there are poachers in those images. It's hard for a human being to see, especially if it's late at night and there are many, many videos to see. For, for the aiding Air Shepherd, we've built a new system called SPOT, which, which uh, exploits the recent advances in computer vision using convolutional neural networks. It is able to spot the poachers and animals in these videos, and we've reported the accuracy and so forth in our recent papers. So the basic idea here is that a human being uh, is look, sitting in the van when the drone flies overhead, spot automatically detects poachers, and then the human being is supposed to notify a ranger saying, hey, we found some poachers, go catch them. Unfortunately, there's not enough poachers, uh, not enough rangers to catch all the poachers. For example, the probability the ranger may actually arrive is 0.3. So there's a large fraction of times poachers can just go through without being caught. So how, what to do? Our collaborators, this Air Shepherd, does the following. When there are no rangers, they will do deceptive signaling. They'll turn on the lights of the drone at night and fly towards the poachers, trying to scare them away, saying, you know, signaling to them, rangers are arriving, run away. And in fact, they do see poachers running away when they do this. 
However, if you always deceptively signal in this fashion, poachers are going to figure out that this is an empty threat. Nobody's actually going to arrive. So we need to be strategic in our deceptive signaling. And this strategic deceptive signaling has been part of the PhD work of my former student, Haifeng Shu. He's worked on this model of Sackleberg security games with optimal deceptive signaling, which uses informational advantage. The defender knows not only the probability the ranger is there, but actually whether the ranger is there or not. So this is how this is supposed to work. Let's take this example. The ranger is available with a probability of 0.3. The drone flies overhead, knows that this is the probability, but also whether the ranger is present or not. And it is now going to truthfully signal to the poachers that the ranger is coming. So in this case, it's being truthful. When there is no ranger with a 0.7 probability and the drone flies overhead, again with a 0.3 probability is going to signal to the poachers that a ranger is coming. So there is a mix of being truthful and being deceptive rather than always being deceptive. These probabilities are adjusted such that it's actually in the best interest of the poacher to run away. So they know they're being lied to. 50% of the time, this is an empty threat, but they don't know which 50%. And so it's in their best interest to run away. And we'll also be truthful in the remaining 0.4 times that there's no ranger coming. So this mixture of being truthful sometimes and not being truthful sometimes is how we can do this more strategic deceptive signaling. And in fact, this signaling reduces the complexity of equilibrium computation. So today, with all of these advances in predicting where snares will be caught, uh, in spot, in detecting poachers from infrared video, in this deceptive signaling, we are now collaborating with smart partnerships, a collaboration worldwide of these wildlife conservation agencies, WWF, WCS, and others, and Microsoft's AI for Earth, to make our software available to wildlife conservation parks, 600 national parks around the globe. SMART is active in all of these parks. We're integrating our software with theirs. And hopefully by the end of this year, we will start getting results from these national parks in terms of us being able to hopefully help them in protecting wildlife. And we're expect, expecting to extend this towards protecting forests and fisheries. So let me come to the last part of my presentation, which is public health. This is work done jointly with Professor Eric Rice in our School of Social Work. Here I'll turn to a homeless population in Los Angeles. We have a crisis in Los Angeles. There's 6,000 homeless youth who sleep on our streets every night. Preventing HIV amongst these youth is a huge challenge because the HIV rates amongst homeless youth are 10 times the rates of the normal house population. So homeless shelters try to run these peer leader campaigns. They'll invite key peer leaders, educate them about HIV, ask these peer leaders to talk to their friends, their friends are supposed to talk to their friends in this way, information can spread about HIV. Note that this is social network, but this is actual real face-to-face -face social network. This is not Facebook, because these youth don't have access to computers and so forth. So this is the traditional problem of influence maximization. We are given some social network, and we are trying to choose K peer leaders to maximize expected number of influence nodes, those who know about HIV testing. And information is supposed to spread using this independent cascade model. So we have a homeless youth A who's informed about HIV testing. There's a probability of 0.4 that youth B will be informed about HIV testing. Of course, immersion in this domain showed us that we don't know these probabilities. So when we inform youth C about HIV testing, we have to figure out that there's uncertainty in how, you know, the probability with which information will reach youth D. We can model that as being sampled from some distribution. In fact, we can say there's interval uncertainty around the mean of this distribution. So how to do influence maximization when there's uncertainty in the social network? This problem has been cast as a problem of a game against nature a zero-sum game where our algorithm is trying to find the best policy, the best youth to select in order to spread HIV information. And nature is trying to choose parameters for these influence spread so as to cause our policy to perform as worse as possible. And our payoff is the regret that we will get, a ratio of performance of our algorithm to the optimal. So here's how this is supposed to work. We have this game where we are trying to choose a policy, select key peer leaders, 
and nature is trying to choose parameter values to cause our algorithm to perform as worse as possible. Of course, we can choose many, many, many peer leaders. Nature can choose many, many different settings for parameters. So this is actually a very large scale game. But just like before with the air marshals, we can do incremental strategy generation. We start with a small game matrix, and then every turn, we add the next best peer strategy, both for our influencer and for nature. And we iterate in this fashion to arrive at a global optimal, but we don't have to expand the full game matrix. We can, in fact, show that we can converge with approximation guarantees, even though nature is sampling from a continuous, continuous set of values. There's one other challenge we have to address, though, which is that we have capacity limits. We want to educate, let's say, 12 youth about HIV prevention. But at a time, we can only bring in four youth. So we call in four youth to educate about HIV. But these are homeless youth. One person on the way to the center may get arrested. And possibly a substitute may arrive. One person may choose to run away. So the people who arrive may not be the ones you actually called. So the next four youth that you call, you have to understand who showed up in the first time step. This is dynamic planning under uncertainty. This can be solved as a partially observable markup decision problem. And now uh, there are algorithms, for example, developed by my PhD student, Amulya Yadav, to solve these, alg these palm DPs quickly. So with these palm DPs and this game theoretic framework, we have a new algorithm called Healer to spread information about HIV amongst homeless youth. To test these algorithm, we tested two versions of Healer in homeless shelters and compared it with degree centrality, the traditional approach. The traditional approach is to bring in the most popular youth and educate them about HIV. So we, sil we recruited 60 youth in all of these three cases, and then we selected 12 peer leaders in each of these case cases, and then we had our social work colleagues educate them about HIV. And the question is, who's more effective in spreading HIV information? In fact, great. Uh, what we noticed is that our algorithms are far more effective in spreading HIV information compared to traditional approaches. In fact, with Healer and Healer++, you can see that 75% of the youth got informed about HIV. With degree centrality, only 25% got informed. Okay, so they got informed, but they actually do any behavior change due to that. We show that with our algorithm, 30 to 40 percent of people started testing for HIV with the degree centrality. No one started testing for HIV. In part, this is because there are very few people who actually got informed. So if you want detailed results, there's a journal of social work and research where uh, all of these numbers are presented in great detail. So again, going back to our data to deployment pipeline, it is important to understand where the data came from. This data for these studies came from a social work colleague sitting in a homeless shelter, observe, doing surveys, observing who's interacting with whom in order to generate a social network, even if uncertain. This is not scalable if you want to take this work to San Francisco and New York and other cities. We needed a different approach such that we could only sample a small fraction of the network and yet do well. And so could we sample just 18% of the network and do just as well. And that's what we've been doing, which is sampling from larger communities. So this is a new algorithm that got published in 2018. In simulation, it performed well. How will it perform in the real world? So again, we recruited 60 homeless youth, 12 peer leaders, but instead of looking at their entire network, only sampled 18% of the network using our algorithm. And here are the results. The sampling did not impair the, you know, reduce the effectiveness of the algorithm. The sample network and our algorithm performed just as well as with the original knowledge of the full network. And in terms of changing behavior of HIV testing, no change. So the sampling has been very effective. And this gives us a lot of confidence that this is a scalable technology. We can take it to other cities. And our partners have been very thrilled with this approach. It's a beautiful way to kind of like marry this, this tech world with this social service world, like and how we can, we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. If this group became a, a really big thing, it could really help out a lot of, of youth. So today we are completing studies with 900 youth in these three homeless shelters in Los Angeles. So as the last part of my presentation, I'm going to talk about 
preventing tuberculosis. This is a worldwide challenge. I'll focus on the challenge faced in India. There's half a million deaths a year due to TB in India. Three million people get infected. We focus on the low resource communities where one big challenge is non-adherence to TB treatment. Patients are supposed to take pills for six months, but many patients drop off treatment. And it's not only problematic for themselves because they don't get well, but then they create drug resistant bacteria, which is a problem for everybody else. So governments are uh, very keen on ensuring that patients complete their treatment. And worldwide now, there's this digital adherence tracking. Basically, on the pill pack, you know, basically when you open the flap, there's a phone number. You're supposed to, the patient is supposed to call the phone number to say, I took my medicine today. And the phone numbers keep changing, and so therefore, governments can track, okay, this person is taking their medicine daily. And there's social workers, we just met some in Mumbai, who look at this track, they track which patient is taking pills and who's not. And then they call these people if people are not taking their pills, or they'll go to their home if the patient has not been taking pills for several days. But that may be already too late. Could we, our task, could we, looking at the phone call pattern, predict ahead of time who's a high-risk patient? And then we can get our limited social worker resources targeted on those patients because we've predicted them to be high risk. And so that's what we've been doing with uh, an NGO called Everwell. And this is our visit in Mumbai to the TB control center and visiting doctors there. And this is work also with Microsoft Research India. Everwell collaborates on software that serves millions of TB patients, not only in India, but other countries. So here's the problem. You get a dashboard, something like this, okay? Patient 6204 didn't call on day one, called on other days. Patient 6214 didn't call on day four and day seven. So on a week, you get a pattern like this. Can you predict who's a high-risk patient by looking at this call pattern? If you can predict 6214 is the high-risk patient who's, not, who's going to drop off, then we could get the health workers to just focus on 6214 rather than spreading their resources. So we have got data for 15,000 patients, 1.5 million calls from the state of Maharashtra in India. So using LSTM's random forest, we are trying to predict high risk of patients. So for example, here, patient one didn't call on day one, called on for the four days. Patient two uh, didn't call on day three and day five. And if we can predict that patient two and four are the high-risk patients, we would be able to get our health workers to concentrate on them. Of course, what we're really interested in is in getting our health workers to pay attention to the top high-risk patients with some constraints on where they can visit and so on, and send them to the field and then get those patients to take their medicine. Now, if we just focus on prediction, we can show that our uh, LSTM and random forest approaches improve prediction on the baseline approach, which is a rule-based approach, by 35%. So we capture more accurately 35% of high-risk patients and reduce false positive by 15%. However, the goal is not just to predict, but actually to prescribe what to do, which patients to actually go and intervene on. So when we just focus on prediction, there's a issue that comes up, and this is normal stage-by-stage -stage approach to solving these problems. Essentially, we do prediction by taking our machine learning model, so we have some fam you know, we have our favorite machine learning model that tries to maximize accuracy, and then it feeds into our optimization algorithm that maximizes decision quality. The problem is that maximizing accuracy doesn't necessarily mean maximizing decision quality. So we want to automatically shape the model loss. Use the optimization problem in the training loop. What do I mean by that? If we just focus on improving accuracy, accuracy can be obtained by discriminating you know, finely low-risk patients. But we don't care about them as much because they are not the ones we will intervene on. It is important to focus on discriminating amongst the highest-risk patients so that we know who to, who to focus on. And that's what this capturing this optimization problem within the machine learning loop does. So we're not doing stage by stage, but instead we are doing decision-focused learning, which is the uh, topic of our AAAI 19 paper, where the prescription model influences how machine learning gets done. In, if we look at traditional accuracy metrics, our decision-focused approach is worse, which is shown in orange. But if you look at overall effectiveness in terms of intervention, 
the decision focused approach works better because it has discriminated high risk cases much better. So Bill Thies, who's a founder of co-founder of Everwell Health Situation, is very excited. He's talking about the work has a lot of potential to save lives. So we are trying to integrate our work with their system, which serves millions of patients, and hopefully in six months or so, we'll start to see some real results. There's many other uh, problems that we focused on. I'll just briefly mention some. Antelope Valley, north of uh, Los Angeles, there's a low resource community, childhood diabetes and other health diseases are a problem. So how to intervene on mothers in order to get them to cook healthy? This is a problem of competitive influence maximization. Suicide prevention is a problem where uh, we, can mon we can select some gatekeepers to monitor others who are showing signs of suicidality. This can be cast as a game and so forth. So living in Los Angeles, being able to work on these challenges, whether it's low resource communities and nutrition, suicide prevention, substance abuse prevention, we're very proud that we can contribute to the city. When the mayor of Los Angeles came to USC and discussed the moral and humanitarian crisis that we are facing with the homeless population, we are really very grateful that as Angelinos, we can contribute back to our city. On the other side of the world, as a Mumbaiker, having grown up in Mumbai, I was very honored to sign a memorandum of understanding with the government of Maharashtra, with the capital of Mumbai, in the presence of the chief minister to use AI for societal benefit. And indeed, working on TB in Mumbai and other such challenges is what we are doing in response. So let me come to the end. To summarize, I'm focused on using AI and multi-agent systems for societal benefits, public safety and security, conservation, and public health. There's a shared multi-agent research challenge that cuts across these areas, optimizing the use of limited intervention resources. And I talked about computational game theory and data to deployment pipeline being completed. I talked about research contributions, whether in models in terms of Stackelberg security games, green security games, or algorithms like incremental strategy generation, marginals, and so forth. Going forward, I see AI has a tremendous potential for improving society and fighting social injustice. But to that end, it's vital to bring AI to those who have not benefited from it, such as in the global south, and to embrace interdisciplinary research with social work and with conservation. Finally, again, going back to this data to deployment pipeline, when we work on AI for societal benefit, it is important to step out of the lab and into the field not only because we care deeply about the societal impact, but because this is how many of these research challenges have actually come up by understanding limitations of our models and algorithms. I'll stop here by thanking all of our partners, uh, whether it's the US Coast Guardsmen or women, rangers on the front lines who put their lives at risk trying to protect wildlife, or social workers, whether in Los Angeles or Mumbai. And thank you. Thank you to them for inspiring us. So thank you all for coming, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, we have time for some questions. Um, any questions from the audience? Yes. Right. Right. So you're saying, what if the poachers uh, somehow are able to get access to what kind of predictions we are making, or something like that? So that's a that's a very very uh, interesting question about. Uh, you know, secrecy and of data and so on. So one of the parts that I mentioned didn't elaborate on too much is the fact that uh, beyond the predictions, there's a, a game theoretic algorithm that sits on top and randomizes the allocation of rangers to these areas. So beyond testing when in regular deployment, the idea is that not only are we making predictions of the high versus low risk areas, but then sending rangers to those areas trying to balance the risk so that sometimes they'll go to high risk and stuff. So at, at the very least, we'll keep the adversary guessing in terms of which areas are we going to hit. 
So that's, that's one of the points. The other point is um, we've worked on extra randomization because there's a chance that the poachers themselves may, uh, the rangers themselves may call the poacher saying, hey, today we are going to go patrol this area. This, this part is you know, open for you to come and attack. And so for that, we've uh, added extra layers of randomization so that it's even more difficult for rangers to understand, oh, we're going north, but we are going to come back south, for example. And so there are things that have been done in order to try to reduce information leakage uh, by basically relying on randomization rather than secrecy to try to uh, protect what we are doing. But it's, a, it's an important problem. I don't wish to minimize it. Uh, we are not allowed to publish maps in our papers, uh, you know, pointing out where all the high and low risk areas are in national parks. So there's a, I mean, there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, th that need to be tackled as we go forward. Okay, other questions? Yes. Yes, yes, I think uh, this is a beautiful uh, question. Uh, we, you know, in a recent paper at Amas 2018, we, we looked at actual influence in the field and who's talking to whom. And uh, clearly there's very little work. In fact, we have found none in influence maximization in phys physical world of how information actually transmits. So what we show is, I mean, regardless, our algorithms are doing better than their traditional methods. So even if, even if we admit that you know, information is not trickling down, which I, which I agree, uh, even then these algorithms are doing better than what was being done previously. Nonetheless, what we found in our paper is that people are not necessarily, uh, the message is not necessarily going from one person to the next person to the next person, but this person who's informed is actually sometimes jumping and informing contacts that are two, layer, two layers away, three layers away, by being excited by, by the information that's given. And so a lot more uh, investigation of what are the underlying models of message transmission purely, I mean, certainly called for. And so what we notice is that despite the fact that, you know, information is being transmitted by jumping layers, if you will, by using the kinds of algorithms we are using, it turns out they're spreading the seeds in the network uh, rather than trying to target people who are very popular, who tend to be in the center of the network and highly connected with each other. And so therefore, even with that, uh, these algorithms which are being strategic in choosing peer leaders are more useful. But clearly, if we can understand the models more, uh, better, then we would be able to perform even better. So clearly, there's some advance that we believe we've made, but there's a whole lot more to do. And this is where, uh, again, going back to this idea of interdisciplinary work, Computer scientists clearly are not doing this work because they don't want to go out in the field and study, I'll say that. Uh, and social workers aren't uh, doing this work because they don't have these detailed models and algorithms to study. So they just say there's a network phenomena, but they are not modeling things at the level of detail for us to understand what is truly going on. 
so the way this work can only happen is if social workers or network scientists and computer scientists come together and combine our models and algorithms and their field work and other skills and do these studies. But unfortunately, very little. I mean, we haven't found a single paper on this topic. Uh, so that's, that's really a, a unfortunate uh, situation. So in all of this, we are focused on always limited intervention resources and in a social setting, and you're trying to strategically select where to put the words in, in, in order to influence behaviors of others. And that's why game theory cuts across all of these. So when we face the problem of how to choose influence maximizers in a social network with unknown parameters, we could use a game theoretic approach. And the idea for generating or scaling up these games and all of this came from the earlier work on being able to solve large scale games in the exactly same way, except there it was in the counterterrorism or defenders versus adversaries, here's influencers versus nature. Even though nature is not adversarial, we're modeling it as adversarial to protect against the worst case. Um, the wildlife conservation domain also, we use the game theoretic approach. So certainly we've learned lessons in game theory going, uh, go, you know, cutting across all of these areas. The idea of data to deployment is another uh, important lesson that we, you know, we've learned and therefore have begun to, you know, sort of con continuously insisting that we have to go end to end. But what you're asking is really a very important question to really try and distill uh, you know, what are the lessons that come, across, you know, come out of working across uh, these domains. There are a few, uh, but uh, clearly something that we need to distill even more. Okay, so let's end and let's um, thank Minan for the great talk. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Thanks. Thank you.